Hi people, so I wanted to make a video, a quick one, if that's even possible for me, about um, my book. I know my book, you know, my, my series of books just doesn't have anything to do with um, artificial intelligence or technology or anything. They're more into another field that I'm in, which is ball jointed dolls. Ball jointed dolls are these, you know, ultra realistic or more anima style kind of doll that is fully articulated and, you know, comes from Asia, comes originally, you know, the first modern ball jointed dolls were made by Volk Japan in 1999. But, uh, you know, originally the system was invented by, you know, French people, German people, you know, like, I'm not going to go into details of this story because it's really long and it's really complex. What you need to know is they are fully made to your taste. You can customize the eyes, the face, the skin color, the features, the gender, you know, everything, everything in the doll, from head to toe, from the paint on the face wherever you can do it your own you can even modify pre-existing dolls to look differently you know like adding elf ears to a doll that is you know human ears or hoops to a doll that doesn't have hoops now and that being said you know there are really big ones and this one that i have is not even in the biggest ones you know the biggest ones are mannequin scales which are really expensive but for the sake of this i just stayed between the ranges of the ones that are more commonly acquired by people and the biggest ones that you know are commonly acquired by people leaving aside you know um Dahlia 90 centimeters stalls, uh, which are just from Dolson, um, and some other factories I think they had like uh, doll leaves might be one, I don't remember now, I need to check. Uh, but it's usually the biggest ones go for around 70 to 80 centimeters tall, uh, 90 in the worst case scenario. You know, there are very big dolls, and um, for the most case, nowadays, they are made of different materials. There are a lot of dolls that are called BJDs, but actually the original BJDs, you know, the original modern BJDs are made with resin, which is a very... Um, heavy material you could be holding up up to five kilograms or six kilograms of resin depending on what doll you're carrying around and i decided to make you know uh, everybody assigns them this is another thing that we do you know with these dolls we don't only create the aspect of the character in the artistic way that how that character is going to look we also assign them a personality so that character will be you know quiet or shy or extrovert you know there are, there really goes a lot into these dolls so this is just a very quick rundown on bjd so um how are and bjd stands for ball jointed dolls now everybody can argue that any doll that has a ball jointed socket for the articulation it's a bjd but in reality it tends to be only the ones who can you know actually fit certain scenarios the other ones are yes very good dolls but they're in different other categories like for instance uh there are vinyl dolls nowadays uh which started by dolphin dream versions which were more animal like you know big eyes typical sailor moon kind of face um or miku kind of face if you're not into sailor moon i don't know why uh, but um the thing was that the ones made on resin were just thriving to be a little tad more realistic. This would include some had been made for very well-known celebrities, you know, people that everybody recognized, like Matt Milkinson's. It has its own 90 centimeters doll, and I don't know who can, you know, Tom Hilderson, uh, Loki has his own, you know, versions of... There, I can name you, like, a lot of actors that got made into these dolls. Because the thing is that you can, as long as you can, you know, sculpt um, 
back in the day was not 3D sculpted, it was just sculpting, you know, with clay and whatever putty you had, and then make a silicone mold and then make a resin copy. So the resin quote copies that came out of that rest of that mold will be you know the final product white resin because resin unlike whatever clay you're using is more likely to withstand the tension of the elastic core that goes all the way through their bodies these dolls are not actually you know just hold together by hinges they are hold together by the traditional elastic core method so um, like I was saying, there is this little big thing about assigning them personalities. And after the personality and the appearance of the doll, it is done. Many people will assign them stories. Who are these characters? Where they come from? What are they been doing? You know, like yada yada. So, um, I was into this community for years. You know, like parallel to other things I was doing or sometimes I was just not doing anything and I was solo on this one. And um, what happened was that I see this huge potential about our costumes are completely insane narrated to somebody from the outside. The things that I've seen the fandom of the BJDs, of the modern resin BJDs go through, it's really crazy, you know, and they are still stuck on that. I just retire from that shit, but, you know, they are still stuck on that. Um, and there are things where I understand that people will tell me, hey, what, did you read this? This is madness, you know, people doing this. And I say, I completely understand that. Trust me, I've been retired from this hobby. That doesn't mean that I've forgotten how the hobby works. So, I said, wouldn't it be amazing if these were kind of our guardians? Because there is a lot of, you know, Japanese mythology on them. Um, 1999, that is 25 years almost ago. Not 25, okay, we're in 2023, less. that will be like 24 years. But, you know, a big time ago, a person in, in that amount of time can just have their own children. So... The thing is that um, there was this, uh, let's just call it manufacturer. There was Bolox Japan, and they were Japanese, of course. Um, so they came up with this entire lore about their own dolls. You know, they kind of said, we're making toys, and we're making toys mostly for, they were making model kits and, you know, Godzilla's or uh, Kamen Rider shit, you know, like Gundam shit. Um, not that I think Gundam is shit, you know, like I'm, I'm saying it's, it's absolutely nothing to do with BJTs. Uh, they were on another market. And according to the, I think it's former president now, uh, of the Bulls company, uh, her, his wife came out and said, like, uh, we need to sell something to the girls. There is a huge market of Japanese girls that just don't buy anything from us because all the toys we got, they appeal more to the boys. So she came up with this idea, you know, there were trial and errors back and forth, and then they finally decided to settle with something called Dolphy, which is, you know, doll figure if you're asking yourself what that fucking means. And every factory has their own, like, uh, acronym for the size or the type of their own dolls, but mostly everybody goes with the definitions of bulks. You know, the sizes, what, what the hell they're all about. So, in essence, um, they started to look back into what do dolls mean for Japanese people. And you can do your own research on that. You know, like you can go to the internet and just, you know, start researching. It's going to take you a while because Japanese, for some odd reason, just don't record what dolls mean to them. Uh, but if you're slightly familiar with creepy pastas or anything, you even should have a, a slight sense of what I'm talking about, which is Japanese people. They don't freak out about ghosts. For them, that is as natural as life. Because that is just another part of life. If you're being born, you're being killed sometime. You're, you're gonna die. So, 
for them there is not such thing as you know the u.s western view of oh it's a, it's a spirit it's a ghost and it's automatically bad no for them Every ghost and every spirit should be judged by, you know, what the fuck they're doing to you. If they're good to you, if they're bad to you, if they're protecting you, if they're not protecting you, you know, like if they're just passing by, if they're just not interested in doing anything to you, but they're just hanging there and people just don't seem to freak out. And trust me, I have a lot of Japanese friends who at some point or are still staying in Japan that had some very crazy stories about ghosts, uh, especially after 2011 tsunami, which was a really big disaster. So um, they believe that dolls that have a human form can be somehow a magnet to these lost spirits because some of them or most of them you know will have this ability of occupying the space inside the doll therefore they are the the spirit the soul is living inside the doll and why would you be just asking? This is going to go Chucky on me? Is it going to go Megan on me? Is it going to try to kill me on me? No, no, absolutely not. Most of the times they really acknowledge that dolls are vessels for spirits of the dead, you know, many generations, and that they even might have a cycle, you know, like a human dies and don't necessarily immediately reincarnate into another human being because, yes, they are Buddhist, you know, they have their own religion, but it's more like their own costume, like nobody is Shintoism. If you're asking yourself, that is the religion of Japan originally is Shintoism, but there's, there's also this fusion with Buddhism, you know, so it's kind of a mix. It's a very weird Buddhism with Shintoism. It's really weird, you know. Japanese culture is their own thing. So the thing is that they say they're not going to try to kill you. These entities are occupying the doll because they want the care and the love that you're giving that doll. They want to feel loved. They want to feel cared. And apparently, you know, uh, after that, that just it's not possible. Nobody's going to give a shit about you. Uh, you're on your own. So many spirits will might choose to stay with a human they feel they like or they feel, you know, close to, either because they're a family or because they just, you know, like the guy or the girl and um, occupy their dolls and live with them, them because they know that at barely physically, humans, we need to interact with something physical, which is the doll uh, and they need the love they need you know the care they need to feel wanted and important and oftentimes it is considered that these spirits are actually protecting children that is why we have on march the 3rd the hina matsuri which is you know a giant festival in which it is you know you you put a display it's like the equivalent to a christmas tree for us they put a display to pray for this is a display full of dolls let's just let that clear out um and they pray for the girl's, you know, prosperity. It's like more known also as the doll festival or the the girl's day or, yeah, the, the little girl's day or something like that. Um, you know, there's a lot of t t to pack in this video. So when these people at Japan making the first resin ball jointed dolls, the first, you know, modern machine this came out with this idea. They said, uh, you know, we need to set some rules. These dolls need to be important. We cannot have people to purchase these dolls and then just, you know, scramble them around or just breaking them like they were nothing because we believe that this soul might be occupied at some period or another or perhaps permanently by some spirit and spirits need to be respected not feared you understand usa so the thing is 
you know, they came up with this very intricate law that was automatically accepted by the rest of the doll collecting community around the world. We were absolutely fine with it. You know, a ghost wants to live inside my dolls, let it. You know, I'll take care of him. You know, I, I kind of like it. I kind of like the idea because these are benevolent you know, spirits in most times. They can get a little bit possessive over time. That is why in Japan there are these um, burning doll festivals. They are not kind of festivals. They are actually um, the equivalent of a send-off, a burial, you know. Uh, like the doll doesn't die, it's unable to die, but it comes time in the life of the child in which, I don't know, the child grows up and needs to go to college or whatever it is they want to do with their lives. And these dolls that are, you know, believed to be occupied by a benign entity might have loved that kid so much and they might have grown with that kid so close that they might not let it go. So they might potentially ruin uh, romantic relationships because they don't want this child to grow up. They, they are stuck into this, you know, eternal version and they want the child to be stuck with them. So they get possessive and they might ruin marriages or that is the belief, all right? I'm not saying this is true. I'm just saying that is the belief. That is what they believe in the entire country. There is more advanced than us. Guess what? So uh, I don't know. Maybe they're right. So the possibilities are endless. Uh, how these benign entities could just screw you over so you don't advance in life because they want you with them. They don't want you to, you know, giving them away or just throwing the doll away. So there is a huge taboo on that. Um, so most people who can afford that, you know, not with BJDs are extremely expensive. I have seen very few BJDs go through this process. But it is concerned that this, and please Google it. If you do not believe me, Google it. Um, these dolls are given a proper send off. They are given a proper goodbye, let's just say. Uh, so, why are they? Because they need to go through the right of being, you know, be, the, the monks thank them for their services and their love and their care towards the children. And then, you know, a, a few years back, they will just put them on ships and uh, kind of making funeral, just burn them. But then, you know, the fishermen will just cut them in their nets. And, you know, that wasn't just really funny. If you have been on some place and you just happen to catch six burned dolls in your net instead of just fish, you know, you're going to have a problem. It's not a nice view. Uh, not even for me, honestly. So perhaps they have been sitting in the sea for long. You know, it's not something you want to you, you wanna put your hand on. So there was this... Uh, this law passed in which they would say, okay, you do the send off, it is symbolic, but the this little boat needs to be tied with a rope so the monks, after people go, uh, just pull them off, you know, like it's symbolic that they go to the sea, they pull them off back to mainland and they burn them, you know, while chanting and praying for the spirits of these dolls to ascend or go somewhere else, you know, just not in that doll. And so they believe their dolls are all kind of possessed, but it's a good thing, you know, like it's a very good thing until you grow up and you don't need the doll because, you know, the doll is like, try to say your mom, you don't need her. Well, unless you have a horrible mom that is waiting for it, you know, she's going to feel bad. She's going to feel like, how could you say that to me? I've raised you. I've been with you, protecting you since you were a child. How can you just throw me away? So the thing is that you need to treat them with respect. And, you know, it was madness for a while. It was madness. You know, the, the entire hobby, it is still madness. We have come into a point in which I either give less shits about the drama in the hobby or I'm just like, yeah, I've been through that, done that, gone through that, doesn't matter. We've been through worse, 
We've been through worse, people. Just put your guns down. This is not uh, this is not just a, a fake alarm, but we've been through worse. We can do this without the guns. So the thing is that I got to stop thinking a few years back. You know, I had my own little problem, as you might know. You know, I have a... You know, you might believe me or not. This is my personal experience. You're allowed to believe me or not. I have my own spirit that just kind of follows me. It's uh, not a completely benign spirit. I've seen it attack other people. And uh, you can try to track them down. I can give you their former addresses or something. I guess I still have their phone numbers from the last time they saw me. And fucking freak the fuck out. This thing that has been attached to me since I was a child. Uh, just kind of stick. And the first tool that I had. Just happens that I felt... And I, I am not asking you to understand this. This is something that only people with disability might understand. This vibration, like uh, electrical current going through my arm into the head of the doll. So either that shit knew that I was going to fucking love that doll and just, you know, stick inside the head. Uh, or, you know, and that doll this year, and it's... 14 years old yes i have a doll that is 14 years old you do not get to ask me how old are my dinosaurs from jurassic park so the thing is that i save things that's why i hate you know biodegradable or eco-friendly materials i like to keep my shit for a prolonged period of time you know if i like something i'm not changing my mind just because i grew up you know, I might change my mind and I might just display them somewhere and not play with them because, you know, I play when I was a child and now they're on display, but I still love them. So we're a perfect match because if these shits can be occupied by spirits and I have absolutely no intention of kicking them out, so we are a perfect match. So, you know, I have like more than 150 dolls and if you're asking how do i afford that i didn't uh you know like i might have afford like a hundred of them you know given or taken but 50 were actually made by me i mastered the element of you know sculpting and making silicone molds and then you know making this and that and actually creating them from scratch you know, once you know how something works, there is a big chance, unless you don't have the materials, that you can replicate it. So I did. You know, I started sculpting my own dolls, my own faces, their own bodies, my own characters, or characters from video games that I liked. And, you know, there were no action figures like Rubik from The Evil Within, uh, which is a horror video game. <laughs> it's a horrific character. But, you know, it's a very sad story. It's a very tragic one. Uh, the thing is that at some point I said, well, what else can, can this hobby offer to me? And that was, you know, how about I make a book? Because, you know, the little books they were, I don't know right now, you know, I, I really don't know. Um, but the little ones they were, they were all in English, not in my own language, which is Spanish. Um, and they were all just kind of plain, you know, how to paint your doll's face, how to do this, how to everything that any tutorial on YouTube could cover. So why would you buy a doll book that is teaching you to do basically what any video can? And I had never read in a book before myself, but I knew that I was a multitasker and I was up to the challenge. So I had a friend who wrote books never helped me you know like the guy just uh you know kind of a mess he was into horror books and that kind of shit i'm i'm not this is not a horror book um it has some tragic elements to it but it's not like there is this uh how are feel lovecraft feeling about it so the thing was there is no horror you know there is a little bit but not in the traditional way of, oh, this is like Chucky, it's going to kill you, it's going to come here to life and for some unknown reason has, a, you know, has the necessity to kill everybody who crossed it. Um, this was a book that set an entire different universe. And I said, how can I construct such universe? 
based on the knowledge that I had in the fandom, you know, and everything that Japanese people kind of believed, I kind of mix it everything up to create this unique world, which is kind of like Toy Story, but not like Toy Story. Uh, this is like, I remember one friend just read the book, you know, in Spanish, because it's currently published on Spanish, um, and said like, it kind of have this taste of being Toy Story, but for grown-ups, you know, it has the raw and the, the, this very real dramatic elements and this, you know, tragedies that happen in between and these topics that are only able to be conceived by an adult mind, but it's also about dolls that interact with humans in a society that doesn't recognize their life. Everybody thinks there are things, there are just toys, there are dolls, but they are actually alive. And only an amount of them have the ability to be alive. Unlike Toy Story, in which any doll could be alive or any toy could be alive, it didn't matter, you know, just the most simple toys could be alive. Here you need you have some let's just call it magical qualities in which you need to be a certain type of doll and uh, not any toy. So if you can fulfill such uh, requisites, which one is to have a hollow inside in which the spirit can reside, uh, you could have, you know, a living doll. But there is just one rule that all dolls are awakened to knowing, which is never disclosure that you're alive to your human or to any human. You know, you can be alive, but you never show that to a human being. And there is this extraordinary weird event in which we are following the stories of these dolls throughout their diaries. We are following the story of you know, a doll named Star, which is, you know, my main doll, and the story of this best friend, which is, you know, nicknamed Doc, and we are following the story of Max and his best friend, you know, and, and so on. Like, there is, a, like, a ton of characters all around in different degrees, but we are reading their diaries. We are not just omnisciently just knowing whatever they're doing. We are reading how they perceive the world. Because the last thing I want to do, it's a Toy Story knockoff in which I'm just copy-pasting the story and adding some more deaths or some more gore. I want this to be realistic. I want this to be comprehensible by people who have been on the BJD community and by people who have been not. You know, something in which people could relate to whatever is going on in the story and could feel something, it is good or bad, for whatever character I'm describing. Uh, you know me, I'm kind of, you know, a kick in the balls for complexity. Um, and then I have to make sure that I'm not, you know, stepping on my own statements. If this universe is going to have a rule, I need to keep that rule in mind whenever. And when you do a book that is more than 400 pages, <laughs> that becomes a problem. You know, I'm just talking about my first book, you know, just just to be clear, just the first one, um, because I want to focus on that one, because, you know, you can't focus on the second or the third one if you don't focus on the first one. So I was there sitting and I said, like, how can I make this believable and relatable? And, you know, and I, I said, like, these characters should be saying in their diaries, which they need a reason to be reading, which they have, sure, um, they should be telling the story of how they see us, humans, how they see their experiences, how or why they record such experiences, and what is the point, you know? How bad are we into the eyes of something that we treat like it's just a piece of shit, plastic, and not a living entity? How much do they suffer in silence? How much do they, you know, because I kind of start thinking about that, you know, about 
that Japanese tradition that has been going for ages beyond whatever you can imagine of considering that dolls can hold spirits. And I said, like, how awful would it be that you are given to a child, you're loved, you're nurtured, the child grows up, and at some point it's a young adult and it's moving out of the house, it's not taking you with them. And it's not giving you away either because, you know, Toy Story 3 just showed us, all right, and he's going to college and he's giving uh, his beloved daughter toys to, uh, you know, the neighbor, I don't recall her name, um, but, you know, it's kind of passing on. But in Japan, that is called short, because it is considered that if the spirit is strong enough, which most surely it will, um, it will kind of chase you down, you know, it's like the equivalent of Boss and, you know, Woody in Toy Story 3 saying, fuck it, we're going to fucking haunt Andy for the rest of the eternity. Now, um, they just don't take lightly, like, as, as you wouldn't. Just imagine yourself, you know, you grew up in your house and once, you know, your mom is a certain age, you are just picked up by police and set into another house with people you never knew. So, yeah, not a, not a cool scenario, you know? Like, when you think about it, that this is happening to you, you know, you might not be that accepting. Because Toy Story 3 kind of gives us the taste of, oh, but the do- the, these toys are accepting of whatever it comes along. They say, like, humans are our gods, and, you know, whatever they decide, it's cool, we're going to handle. And in my story, not all of them are like that, because for Japanese people, most of them are not like that. You know, they they just say, like, you know, screw fucking humans, I'm going to... And they might just, you know, the spirit might just cause inconveniences, so to speak, in your future life, just because it doesn't want you to grow up. Which is impossible because, you know, everybody's going to grow up. Everyone's going to, you know, go through a phase and then forget about whatever shit they were into. Most people, at bare least. Not me, apparently, but most people. Uh, so the thing was to portray that. How do they feel? You know? Uh, and, and, you know, I met horrible cases of people just you know, breaking their dolls on purpose or bullying other people because of their dolls, because they didn't like them or they were too cheap or whatever the fuck it was. So I took every single ounce of my knowledge into these stories. You know, the knowledge that I had from how the fandom of the Battle Shrine, the dolls of the PJD, you know, acts towards another, one another, and just, it's awful. If you're, if you want a spoiler, it's awful, you know, humans are awful, you know, and, uh, these dolls get stuck in between. So how do they feel? How do they, uh, you know, have expectations and then they're broken or how they're actually loved and cared for? And the whole story revolves about this uh, kind of set of prefix characters that start to remember what were their past lives. And they discovered they were humans once. They were not always dolls. They were humans. You know, so, and as the humans, they had just very tragic lives and very tragic deaths. And, you know, shit went on. And I'm, I'm not spoiling, but. Um, and then we have, you know, the loose diaries, which I like to call the short stories, which are very small diaries that tells the specifics of a certain character, you know, just, and at the first you don't know why all these little diaries are being written, but, you know, later on you just find out why these diaries exist. There's a very good reason, I assure you that you are going to have to trust me. Um, in which they describe the things they're going through, either because they feel the need to write it down while it's happening or because they just, you know, were required to write it down. That's all I'll say. So um, through these encounters, uh, we get a very, you know, it's like 
have you ever thought about Marvel Cinematic Universe in which we forget about DC, all right? DC did everything wrong in the wrong order, but Marvel did something wonderful about storytelling. I'm not going into the characters themselves. I'm going about how they put some order into the stories themselves. They did not just make one movie about Iron Man and the next one was The Avengers. No, they did one or two movies about Iron Man, then just throw Thor in the mix, then The Incredible Hulk. You know, they cannot tell the story of each character prior assembling them. Because once you assemble a lot of characters, you don't have the ability, the capacity, or it just doesn't add up if you just stop in the middle of the narration or the, let's just call it action, to focus on one character and how that character came to be. So what you need to do is pre-establish who are there, who are these characters. And I played a little bit with that because, you know, it's a book and I don't need a great budget to do so. So I said, I'm going to make like, I don't know, like, I don't remember how many short stories are there, but like like 10, 12, you know, short diaries prior the main story. And you don't know which one of those characters, each on each diary, is going to be actually relevant to the main story until you start reading the main story. And even if you do, you don't know. It's like Rick and Morty opening in which you see scenes, but you're not absolutely sure that every one of those scenes is going to appear in the season. You know, most times, some of them will, but there are others who are never explained and they're just there. So I said, like, I want people to read this and perhaps they just, some of those characters, they just have just like this absolutely um, insignificant cameo, you know, like some other more important to the development of the story character cross their paths and just see them and just, you know, makes an observation, a mental note about these characters being here or there. And you kind of know what happened to them at the end, but they're not part of the story itself. They're just there. So I just had so many real life stories of real life people, of real life experiences in this hobby to translate into marvelous new tales and just try to make it work from the perspective of the doll that I just, I think I did something kind of unique because although you can always argue, you know, it's kind of like Toy Story, it is actually not. In Toy Story, you don't get the characters to, all right, it's a movie, you know what they're feeling towards humans and so on, but they need to express it out loud or you need to see it. Now with the book, you don't have that. You don't have the expression of somebody's face. You need to narrate that. And if you narrate too much, like you're a, a god and you know everything that everybody's feeling, it kind of takes away you know, the suspense. It kind of takes away a lot of secrecy, a lot of, you know, details. You're going to learn further on the narration. So I said, like, I want to keep this consistent and compact, you know. And if people want to read smaller tales, you know, quicker tales, like six or, or 12 pages or 20 pages at pre, you know, but the, the longest ones, uh, they can actually read them. And um, then we have the main story, which is for people who says, all right, these tales got me hooked up. I really like how this is going, so I'm going to engage into the main story, which is, you know, like main, it, it speaks by itself. It is still in the format of a diary, but it's the main story. So, I kind of think that it was something that nobody else had done, or at least that I never knew somebody else to do. I'm pretty sure somebody else did it somewhere. You know, it's like making fire. You know that you're not the first one to invent it, but you're pretty sure you don't know nobody else who has done it, which is a lot for me because, you know, like, I was everywhere. I'm, I'm like, I'm like Stericia Coley, 
you know, many people hate me, but the truth is I'm everywhere. So the thing is that um, I never saw no one do that because everybody was so concerned into making, I have, there were two type of books, you know, one type of book, there was BJDs and the pictures I took about them which was absolutely no context, just pictures and pictures and pictures. Trust me, I have those books. And the other one was tutorial on how to be a pro on this or that. Or, and it was just like, dude, there are thousands of tutorials. And I don't even think people should be guided by a single book. I think people should be like me, you know, watch different videos, different tutorials, because each tutorial will tell you how to do something. And even if they're all about making a wig or making eyes or, or you know, painting your doll's face, the truth is that at some point you might find that you have access to one thing, but not to the other. So if you just collect the information from several tutorials, you can make your own mix about, okay, this technique until here. And from here on out, I'm going to try the next tutorial technique because I don't have the materials for that and so on and so on until the project is finished. And that kind of works. You know, I haven't hired anybody to paint my doll's faces ever. You know, just like the first one kind of came and it wasn't technically the first one. You know, it was like the second one, that, but that was the factory's fault, not mine. So... We have this scenario. It's really weird. It's really fishy, but it's there. We have this scenario. And um, people just don't make storybooks. And the ones who are telling a story about their dolls, they're just like Lord of the Rings. You know, they're not focusing on the obvious fact that these characters are dolls. No, they're saying this doll represents a uh, uh, green elves from the woods. And they just, and that is just, you know, people has done that for ages. You know, Dungeons and Dragons exist because people tend to have that idea a lot. So the thing was that I found myself in this awkward position in which I really didn't have the book that I wanted to read. And what happens when I don't get something that I want? I made it. <laughs> so that is why I made a book. Um, you know, and of course, once the first one was made and corrected and over and over again and published, and I was, you know, presenting them and signings and, and all the yada yada. I, I'm not a person who like, I don't like to be famous, you know. It was kind of fun, kind of just like it was fun to interact with people who shown so much uh, interest in my book even though they didn't knew me they might not even know the dolls themselves but they were very attention gripping i remember being signing books with some other authors and they were doing you know poetry or some shit like that something that a thousand humans have done before and i was there standing I had made, you know, bookmarks, all out of my budget, you know, like taking my dolls who were the protagonists of the book to the signing, you know, and people could take pictures with them, people could interact with them, could touch them. How often do you get to touch the main character, the official main character of something you're reading? You know, it's not like C.K. Rowling's had, you know, Harry Potter sitting beside her you know, or server Snape waiting for her. So this was a huge deal because the actual characters of the book were there. And even if you haven't read the book, even if you didn't knew what was going on, these are 70 centimeters tall dolls. They are huge dolls. As you can see in the pictures, they are huge, you know. So they were sitting around me while I was just uh, getting people buying my book and asking me, can you sign it for me? Can you make just some note for me? Can you make a drawing for me? You know, I also draw, you know, if, if, if you need to know. And I was making drawings, I was signing, I was chatting, it was just amazing time. But I didn't knew it because I wanted to be acknowledged. I didn't knew it because I wanted to be famous or rich. And that is the precise point of it. Everybody who hated me, which was just like a lot of people in the fandom, 
um, kind of just said, oh, no, but she's losing money there because everything and all they can think about is cash. You know, they don't think about art. They want to be call themselves artists, but they're not doing it for the art. They are doing it so people say, oh, have you seen that person? That person must be really important. Look what they did. And I don't want recognition. I don't want applauses. I don't want shack shit. All right. I don't want, you know, and it's not like I don't need it. I desperately need an extra income. But I'm doing it out of love to the art. If I don't love whatever the shit I'm doing, I just don't go with it. Because I know if you do something that you do not love, that is going to come out horribly. You need to love what you're doing. You need to feel like you need to do it. Because there's a part of you that if you don't do it, won't just shut up until you fucking die. And that is being an artist. That's why when an artist says, I cannot make 600 bucks out of this doll that it just took me one week to make, and I'm so preoccupied, you know, I cannot just, I, I need to take my time to breathe. Because it is painfully obvious they're doing it for the cash. It's a money grabber, you know. And that is the difference between, let's just say, Replica 2015 and Replica 2023. One is a work of art and love. The other one is a money grabber. And you, if you were there, can see the difference. So whenever you're going, this is my advice to anyone out there. If you're going to do something to be accepted on a group, if you're going to do something that you're not really interested in for some for becoming part of some community, if you're not going to uh, be doing something because you love them, you're going to do something because you want the money, because you want the monetization, because you want whatever shit comes along, you know, just don't do it. It's gonna go awfully wrong. I get it. You want money. I get it. You need to pay your rent. I get it. You know, I get it. But the moment in which you completely sell your soul to the higher bidder, you just stop doing good things. And I've seen this, I don't know if I'm able to mention it, but since I'm not monetizing this channel, fuck it. Um, I've seen this happen with um, certain YouTubers. You know, they start doing something they love because they love them, you know, because they really like to do that. And they just develop and become so well known and they become, you know, so quote famous online speaking that they end up making deals with Amazon. They end up making deals with, you know, this and that and their content suffers. It's just the same old content. It's the same old goddamn story I've heard a thousand times. So I like to be there when the YouTubers and influencers or whatever shit they are, you know, they are just young. I like your content. But whenever they grow up, they become bitches. Bitches of the money. They become slaves to the currency. They become slaves to monetization. They cannot do, uh, you know, videos saying, SHIT! They can do very little things and they get restricted by these laws applied by companies. And also, if you're, you know, with personal problems, a family, kids, whatever it is, which I don't have. So, you know, I can just pour my soul into something completely. 100% I'm into this, you know. I don't need to be thinking about my kids. I don't need to be thinking about my husband or my wife. I don't need to be thinking about shit. You know, I'm here. 100% I'm here. I'm focused on this. Um, this is important. This is, you know, this is, you know, but these people, they all get, you know, families. They get married. They have kids. And God, I'm very happy for them. But some activities are incompatible with having a life. I'm good at what I do most of the times because I do not have a life, you know. And that is not because I hate myself and I'm saying, I, no, I love the fact that I don't have a life, that I don't have a preset life, that right now I'm so fucking free. I love that. 
because that allows me to say fuck it today i want to do this fuck it today i want to do that and that's it you know no no extra money grabbers no extra rules no extra monetization no extra shit you know like um and it's not like i don't need the money i desperately need the money you know like we have leaking pipes all over the house that haven't been fixed you know and then we're struggling to get to ends meet but luckily i live with my parents you know it's a big house technically um i live with my parents because you know my my dad is abusive my mom needs me kind of kind of so um i don't pay rent they don't pay rent we owned this house we purchased it long ago you know it might be shitty but it's ours and once you get off your shoulders the payment of a rent each month is a huge relaxation because no matter how bad you are how little you eat you are low maintenance you know you need to pay for rice to get on your table you need to pay for i don't know some plain pasta to put on your table and that's it you can survive you pay for water you you pay for the most basic you don't you don't know how i wanted to tell you this you know how much internet do i have in my house three <laughs> yes and i'm not talking about terabytes i'm talking about megabytes i have three megabytes of internet that's why uploading a video could take about five hours because i save the videos on my phone and then i have to upload them with three megabytes that takes a while <laughs> you know when was the last uh the last pc i put together like about 12 years ago so realize that you know so you know when i purchased my tv 2009 actually it was uh december 2008 because everybody thought i was going to die and they just kind of allow me to have you know a new tv partially because my dad is a dick and thought that if i was going to die then he was going to inherit my tv because that is how my dad works so uh the thing is you know nothing that i have is kind of new And I really desperately need the money, but I would never sell my soul for money. I will never sell my art for a profit. Often my mom comes along and said, you're breeding reptiles, you're breeding, you know, leopard geckos, and you're spending all this money on supplements, vitamins. You know, you're paying it from your pocket. Whenever you sell them, you sell them so fucking cheap, you put like five times more cash inside that animal than the ones you are getting and she's completely right and i look at my mom and i said i'm doing it because i like to i'm doing it because i love to i'm not doing it because i want to make money out of reading reptiles and with the book was pretty much the same i was doing a book because i wanted to do the book not because i wanted the fame the glory the recognition the money I just didn't fucking care you know i had something to say and i thought it was important enough for me to say it in a book and something about books is there are very low maintenances because trust me when my with my very old computer which has not even a flat screen i'm, I'm using like a barely working big chunky monitor <laughs> so with my very old computer I am constantly working on it because the only thing I need that computer to open it's worth. And you know, I have a generic keyboard and that's it, you know, like that that's fucking it. You don't need that. How am I making these videos? With my cell phone in my face. That's it. I don't need more. I don't need a setting. You know, it will be cool to have it, but if I don't, it doesn't mean I'm going to stop making content. So Just hear me out. And now that you kind of know how my brain works and how all of this kind of works, um, I was wondering, you know, 
I've been a translator for several other people along the years, also an illustrator, also yada yada. Um, but I've been thinking, you know, like, I never translate my own books, which is hilariously weird, but yeah, I never. So, um, also like, I want to translate my books, but I don't want to hold them back to a physical um, kind of cover. First of all, because I don't, you know, I'm good at English, but I don't think I'm that good to be charging people for a translation that I did myself and nobody corrected because I might get it wrong here and there you know and I'm pretty sure that I'm going to have to slightly change some sentences although it will be the same book you know still um and I'm so like I can just translate this sheet get a pattern which you can you mean you you have to just save and pay the pattern but you can um they might never read whatever the fuck is there because most people in Argentina just don't speak English. But uh, you can, you know, uh, make it yours so nobody else just kind of copy paste your book and sell it somewhere. Not that I kind of mind it, but I will do mine if they don't say I copy paste it from this person. So I just don't care about how much money you're making out of it. I will really, really, really care about if you do not at very least mention me and say, yeah, this was the girl who had the original idea, you know. But I know people who is still intellectual property is just not into that. So <laughs> I kind of patent things prior exhibit. But I've been thinking, I've been really thinking, you know, like first I thought about Amazon books. You know, why? Because they offer shipping worldwide, because they kind of offer a lot of shits. But I don't know if I even qualified. I don't have an Amazon account. And uh, even if I did, I need a, I suppose, I need a PayPal account. And, um, you know, a lot of things go into that. And and, um, then again, I thought putting this absolutely low price, like 90, 90 cents. Not because I think my work words 90 cents it it works a lot more but i don't want people to be restricted by the price i want people to be able to access this but then again i thought about it and i saw like what if i'm just saying what if i just make it free you know and then another thought came along which was what about if i don't only make it free but accessible towards any platform like YouTube or Spotify, you know, and like a podcast kind of scenario. You know, people will not will have not to be sitting and reading, even if it's on a tablet or a phone, they can just keep doing things on their house, you know, just preparing dinner or whatever and listening to the story that I'm saying. And you guys kind of help a lot because most of you guys kind of said, you know, like, we like your voice. We like how you express yourself. We like the tone of your voice, your accent. It's weird. You know, I'm pretty sure many people might hate my voice and, you know, just don't get along with it. But now that I'm recovering my voice, you know, I'm just barely coughing. As you may have noticed, I haven't coughed in the entire video. Um, I said... Wouldn't it be nice that these people can just, you know, whenever I'll, I decide to or I'm able to publish a new chapter or a new short story about the book translated to English, to just hit play and start doing things on their house and just listen to the story? Because, you know, that would be great. I would like to do that. I do that, in fact. You know, I look for podcasts or, you know, I'm mostly into not that much true crime. I find it, you know, copy pasta being more, you know, or horror stories being more fun when I'm working with my reptiles and I'm, you know, cleaning poop, basically, and feeding, you know, these little ones. Um... And I, I kind of find it like, you know, refreshing to have some voice in the back, you know, that is telling me a story. And just because I'm completely quiet, I don't talk. I don't 
make certain moves. I, I'm just that kind of person. I'm very focused. And I can hear the story. And it's not like I'm not paying attention. I am paying attention to the story, but I'm also paying attention to whatever I'm doing, which is practically a mechanical movement because once you know what you have to do, you just go ahead and do it. So the thing is that I kind of just start playing with the idea on my head and saying, huh, this isn't that bad. You know, like, it, it could be a lot worse. It, this isn't that bad. I should make a podcast. And then I say myself, like, about what? Like, about what? What are you going to say in the podcast? Because horror podcast, a lot of them. True crime, a lot of them. You know, strange, dark, and mysterious. You gotta pay, but yeah. So, um, the thing was that I stop and consider and I say, I can translate my books and I can make it a podcast and people will just get, I don't know, a chapter a week or, you know, a, a small story a week. And, you know, if they like what they're hearing, I can spread the word. You know, people will know that these stories exist and that, you know, and I don't need to make a single penny out of it because I don't, I don't even if I need the money, I don't think that this is my goal. My goal is that I just like what I do. So um, let me know your thoughts about it and if you would be, you know, into that kind of thing. You know, like, I know this is, has nothing to do with AI or technology or anything and, you know, might not take away um, necessarily the process in which I'm uploading my regular videos and my regular replies to you guys in the channel, but I don't know. I think it will be a cool idea. I don't see why not, because this is such a deep, interesting, uh, you know, real life almost, because, you know, everything is based about real life uh, scenario in which you are getting introduced that... I don't know. I think many people might enjoy it. Not only people that like dolls, but people who is kind of, you know, there for the joy, for the ride, um, and also for the tragedy. Why not? Because I, I need to warn you all, these are not happy-go-lucky stories. These are not children's stories. These are not stories that you want your five-year-old to read or to hear. These are sometimes very traumatic stories because some choices that the characters make along the way, you know, they are very faithful towards one cause and then they make a choice that has absolutely no sense. And there was this um, this very dark chapter that I never publish. I never, it's not on the book, it's not on the first book, nor in the second one, nor in the third one, you know, but I share it with a friend of mine who was a writer, still is, I suppose, um, and he said, wow, that's dark, but it makes completely sense about why this character made this choice during the book, because during the book, you know, there was one choice that was absolutely out of character that one of the characters makes. You know, it's just a small choice, but fucking screws everybody else, you know, and he never talks about it. He never opens up. No matter how much they push him, he never talks about it. So, you know, one time somebody asked me, why did he do that choice? What did he, why? You know, it, it must have had a very good reason. And I got thinking about that I already knew the reason because I had this idea, but I thought, this is just too dark. You know, <laughs> this is just, this is really extremely graphical content. I can, I'm, I, it's not because I'm ashamed of it. It's just that I can't put it on a book and just don't tell people, you know, that will elevate the rating of my book to perhaps easily plus 18. You know, even if these are dolls. So, there is graphic violence, there is graphic abuse, and, you know, I understand why, but I never told anybody. So, <laughs> this guy comes around and said, like, look, 
I loved your book, but I have just one question. Right at the end of the first book, why the, f well, you know, why the fuck does this character does this? It just doesn't go with the character itself, you know, with interest. And, and you never explained that. And I said there is a very good explanation, but you can't know it. <laughs> And the guy said, how come that I can know? That's like, okay, you're my friend. You write books. I'm going to go back to my house. I'm going to open, you know, a Word document. I'm going to type the entire story, you know, the entire short, uh, you know, explanation of what happened and why it happened. And I'm going to send it to you. And you're going to see why it's not on the book, on the printed book. And yeah, I did that, and the guy was just like, "Girl, you are dark. You're really messed up. That that's that was that that was that was heavy. <laughs> I never thought I would say that about a story regarding dolls. That was insanely bad. And and then he advised me, you know, kind of helped me that to realize how bad it was." and how I could actually present it in not such a graphic way. He said like, well, okay, so you should change this and do not mention that because it is implied. You know, everybody who has to work in neurons, well, kind of know what's going on there. So just mention this, but do not go into details about this other thing because Uh, you know, get your way around it. It's like when you're, and there, there are no sex scenes because these are dolls in my books, but it's whenever, you know, I was talking to a fellow enthusiast, which was, you know, a longtime friend long ago, who was into reading um, interview with the vampire kind of books. So he was arguing, not even Anne Rice, which is the author, if you're asking yourself, of Interview with the Vampire, uh, can go around whenever they need to have sex. He, she needs to uh, just say, you know, dick, <laughs> you know, penis, <laughs> so, uh, you know, booby. So, um, and I said, like, I bet you a hundred bucks I can describe a sexy scene without saying a single word that even suggests, but you know what's going on. And he says, like, no, if Anne Rice cannot do it, you cannot do it. And, you know, there's something in my life that whenever somebody tells me, if, you know, Stephen King can't do it, you can't either. It just enrages me more into trying it. Even if I fail, you know, perhaps I fail. Perhaps it's just like the person said, you know, but I'm going to try, you know, <laughs> you got to try. Uh, it's like Bon Jovi's song. It's my life. It's now or never. So I kind of just presented the guy. I remember I wasn't, you know, into writing books anyhow, but I presented, you know, this scenario in which two characters were having their way uh, and it was explicit, but at the same time, I never used a single word like, you know, tits, vagina, penis. So I just, I, And you will read it, and the guy was just amazed. And so, like, I understand they are fucking, and yet you didn't mention anything. How did you do that? And I said, like, imagination. Like, I understand Unrise, perhaps it's a different person that does things differently. Perhaps she wants to use those words. Perhaps she thinks they have some kind of impact. Perhaps she's horny while writing. You know, I don't know, some book writers who write these kind of things just kind of get off with it. And I don't blame them, you know, to each their own. But the truth is that it can be done. So when this guy, you know, a lot of years later, tell me, send me the story and just explain why your character didn't take another choice, I sent it and just go back and say, you can't publish that. And I'll say, I know that's why I'm not in the book. And so I'm like, but how about you change this part and this part? Because that guy kind of believed in me, <laughs> kind of knew I could do it. So, she, so she just lower it down, not use words that are just so specific 
just kind of give the impression and if the writer or the listener in this case will have the imagination to get to the conclusion they would and even if they don't have the imagination to get to the conclusion they will still have a pretty good idea that something really bad is going on so why don't you just try to do that and we were going to make you know uh, include that in you know another future release and then you know a lot of things happen um Among them, I just kind of slowed my pace down because I was working on my second book and then COVID hit, which meant that, you know, everybody was on battery save mode. We had no cash to spare. We didn't know if tomorrow we were going to be alive. So I dedicated my life to just work on them and just finish my works and, you know, make a pattern out of that, but just not publish them on paper, not to go because you You know, there was lockdown, literally, and Argentina had a very strict one, so you could not just go around just asking for editorials, just, you know, you could do a certain things throughout the internet, you know, sending manuscripts and all that shit, that, that was cool, but there was so much that was restricted that, you know, you couldn't do that, you couldn't, you know, ask would you be willing to, and even if they were, You know, recession hit hard because they were a year almost. They weren't just selling a goddamn thing. So many of the, you know, publishers that were smaller that I knew kind of closed, you know, or enter on hiatus. And there are right now in 2020, you know, end of 2022, beginning of 2023, they are starting to, you know, go up. And, and say, we're still alive, we're still alive, we were just went into a long hibernation period, but we are still working, uh, so it, it was disastrous, it was, it was really bad for the economy, I guess everybody can agree that, regardless if you know the editorial business or not, so, um, you know, things happen in between, but that didn't stop me from keep on writing, because, you know, that was free, You know, I could sit and fucking write and nobody's going to say anything. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I was thinking, you know, at least start with the first one. You know, translate the first one and just put it on something here on YouTube that people can listen. And, um, yeah, I want to I wanna know what's your opinion. Would you be willing to listen to it? I have like 500 subscribers and I know most of them are just here for the tech news and the AI opinions, but you know, uh, I know this is a completely different topic, but wouldn't it be fun? I don't want money for it. I don't want monetization. And the last thing I know is people hearing to the story and then being cut out in the middle by an ad. I don't want ads, you know, I don't want monetization. I'll be happy if I have more followers. I'll be happy if I have more, you know, watch hours or likes, but that is not my goal. You know, because many people just want to reach the bare minimum so they can engage into monetization. I just don't. I just I just think that that's not my thing. Um, perhaps one day I will open, I don't know, a coffee account or or some donate if you fucking feel like it but yeah not, not right now you know like right now it's just not my goal you know just and I don't want ads in between my videos so I feel very distressed when I'm hearing something or I'm watching something and I'm working and I'm right in the middle ads right in the middle ads you know and I'm like oh god they want to kill someone you know I thought we left ads in the time of the 90s with the cable TV because, yeah, watch the movies, no ads. And then cable TV had ads and they said, like, watch streaming, no ads. And then we watch streaming, no ads. And then they said, like, watch the internet, no ads. And then the internet got ads too. So ads everywhere. So it's kind of distracting. Sorry to say that out loud, kind of super distracting. So, you know me, you know how I work. And I just explain you 
kind of the basics. I know this video is a lot longer than I thought it will be, but kind of explain you the basics. Will you be in or out to hear this? Because, you know, it's a huge work to translate something that I already read in, you know, a long time ago, <laughs> already read in. It's a huge work to translate that into another language, you know, and then... You know, the, the easy part is to read what I translated and to make it a podcast or a video. But seriously, it is a huge work to translate it. I know I should. I know I should. Before I die, I know I should. You know, there is no Rosetta Stone for me. But um, would you be willing? You know, this is a new kind of thing that I'm... I, it, it has, again, it has absolutely nothing to do with technology. It's all about... You know, tradition, magic, beliefs, but not just like in Lord of the Rings kind of scenario in which, you know, it's completely bullshit, it's completely magical. And if something doesn't add up, a magician did it. No, um, this is based on real actual beliefs that real actual people have in the real actual world. So, yes, it has a fantasy level to it, but these are things that are and can be found throughout different cultures, different people who is into these different things or topics. So, I don't like to just invent things more than I have to. Like, if I need a new goddess or if I need a new, you know, whatever, um, there are like a ton of things in different religious or not literatures that just adds up you know like why should i invented them i could make people say oh i recognize this name it's from the here or, or there i recognize this concept it's like this or that up to the point in which i was doing it unconsciously because there was like a couple concepts in which some other friend a female friend um just kind of called me and she says like it's amazing how you integrated this chinese lesson to the italian i did what it's just like, yeah, this this is this Chinese lesson kind of in the background whenever you... Wait, wait, give me a second. I have to Google it. And yeah, what I had written kind of just was absolutely in touch with a Chinese lesson I didn't even knew it existed. At very least, not conscious. I don't know how it happened. So um, there are a lot of concepts there that could be traced to one place or another. I know, you might call that mistake sloppy writing, but you know, the idea was good, the concept was good, and I thought I was being not original, but you know, kind of just not following a trend there. And it turns out, like I said, nothing is going to be new. The only thing you can deliver as new are your unique ways to tell a story or your unique presentations but if you discover fire somebody else did it prior to you if you discover a concept or an idea chances are it's somewhere else that's why i don't really feel bad when people just say like it's like toy story but with a lot of things for adults because you know toy story was not even the first story in which we are using dolls or toys to tell how awful humans are because Pinocchio, you know, like it, it, not not you know, lateless movies, like the very first version of the story of Pinocchio, that was thousand years ago. Well, not that much, but you got the idea. You know, it was a long time ago, and they already knew. They already were thinking about that. And I bet if you go to Japanese people, the concept of dolls being alive is just even older than Pinocchio. So um, why should I feel bad, you know? Because in that same reference, we could say that Toy Story is just a rip-off of some um, Asian legends and some Sherman fairy tales and some things match up. And yes, it is. It is. It basically is. But that doesn't make any less enjoyable the experience that doesn't make any less good of a movie or good of a tale so again no idea is completely new 
What is new is how you present it. What is new is the few elements you add to that story to make it compelling, to make the people say, I want to keep on reading this or I want to keep on listening to this because I want to know what happened to these characters. And there are very, you know, I've been told, you know, for me, sometimes our characters that I don't relate with, you know, one thing that is often very used by writers is that... Um, they kind of pour too much of themselves. So every single character in the book is them. You know, it's them, it's them, it's them, it's them, it's them. I had, you know, uh, book writing uh, published friends that, you know, you, you got to pick up one of their books. <laughs> kind of just 90% of the main characters were them. And I was like, dude, seriously, you know, perhaps people purchasing your book just doesn't know you, but I do know you. This is you. Just fuck it off. You know, like you need to put yourself into the shoes of somebody else who thinks completely different, has completely different values and priorities. And that is good writing. Whenever you can separate yourself. So what I did was to isolate myself and everything that I think and that I feel into one single character and say, this character is going to be everything about me, you know? And it's just a background character. It's not even a main character. You know, it's just, I'm in the background. I'm there. I'm there, but I'm in the background. <laughs> so this character is going to act like I would act. It's going to think and feel like I would think or feel. It's going to do the shits, the crazy things that I will do or that I have done. Uh, but the rest of the characters, each in their own right, need to be themselves, need to be different. Because you can't have like... I don't know, 100 characters and they're all copy pastes of some aspect of your personality. Of course, book writing is a lot of pouring yourself into the book, but many people just take that literally and that's how Mary Sue's are born. And I didn't want a Mary Sue in my book. No matter if I... Because I have my favorites, I do. Uh, no matter if I like one character more than the other, I just didn't want that. Now, it is something pitiful that, you know, people it's doing unconsciously, but that is the reason why I kind of read my own book like 300 times prior publishing, because I wanted to make sure not even a typo will escape me. You know, I don't promise to do that during the translation, because that's not my original native language, but I can promise to kind of you know, give my best. And it's free, for fuck's sake, so just don't complain. You know, there are worst, worst free content on the internet. So that is one thing. If you're going to write a book, just don't pour yourself into a single character or into all of the characters. Because just reading a book in which you know, after the, I don't know, 12th page how every single main character it's going to act or what is going to happen to them is just not realistic. In real life, you don't get away with everything. You're not the prettiest. You're not the luckiest. You're not the smartest. You're not the most powerful one. You're not, you know, the one every single character falls in love with. Um, in fact, most of the times in my own experience, I had like a very horrendous love life in the effects that sometimes I will be in love seriously with one person and that person was not in love with me, was in love with somebody else. And some other kid that, you know, we were, you know, high school, elementary, whatever it is, uh, that was absolutely on to me, I just had no interest into them. So I've been plainly rejected on my face and I had to reject other people in their faces. And I totally felt bad about it. I felt like a piece of shit. But in that feeling like a piece of shit kind of just reminds me that other person that rejected me must have felt like that because they were so polite to try not to hurt my feelings. But... They were not going to go ahead with, you know, dating me or going out with me when they didn't feel like it. So I kind of understood that when you are in both sides of the same 
parameters when you are being rejected, but you are rejecting other people. You can't understand how the people who rejected you kind of felt. You know, some dicks, some were dicks, and if I knew they were dicks, I didn't even say it. You know, I would appreciate them from afar. I will not just go and tell you know, I like you. No, no, I wouldn't say that because I knew how it was going to end. You know, they, they had absolutely no care in the world about hurting me. And some, if they hurt me, the best. But, uh, you know, when I have some some encounters with some people who were actually, you know, kind to me, I will just eventually go ahead and present the situation and say, I like you. You know, I, I think you are very you know, appealing to me in a way. Uh, so, and they will just kind of say like, I like it too, but you know, like friends, we could be friends. And you know, those kind of people still got invited to my birthdays, you know, still hang out with them because everything was cool because they were adult enough to manage a situation in which, you know, they kind of knew this was, you know, even if I look like very hard and very, you know, I can take a hit. Why hitting me? You know, like why doing, why going far and beyond into hurting somebody? And whenever I turn around and I look at other people who was, you know, severely in love with me, I will just look at them and just, you know, ask myself, why would I want to hurt this person? It did anything wrong with me? I mean, if it's a stalker, just, you know, bash their heads with a baseball bat. But if it's, you know, just a good guy that just happened to have the bad luck to like me and I don't like him, just why to bash his head on the floor? You know, like there is absolutely no reason. Let's just not give him a worse time than it deserves. So there was a lot of that growing up. And... um I think some experiences in your life just gives you this kind of perspective about how to handle some situations, you know, how to make some very bad situations likable or relatable, because we all have been rejected at some point, and we all have rejected somebody at some point. So... For instance, you know, my character, like I said, is like a background support character. But it has this kind of thing going on in which, you know, one character, and it's not because it's ugly, because that is often the case. It's not that the person is ugly, it's just you are not into them. It's severely in love with her, but she just kind of doesn't jump into that train. Now, it's never explicified that she jumps into any train. She's kind of like, I'm going to stay, you know, out of this. Uh, but... Um, she kind of likes, you know, like you kind of see she has a favorite from all the dolls. She has a favorite. And it's not the one who is absolutely, you know, I'll do anything for you scenario. It's just another one that is just like we're very good friends. We're like brothers, uh, you know. But, you know, there's this awkwardness in the situations that I try to translate to the best of my abilities in which... You kind of see, you know, in some scenarios, you kind of see that this other doll is just so into, I don't want to lose you. I don't want to, you know, I, I want to tell you how I feel and then realize, you know, you know, this is going to end bad because I realized that this person is not into loving me it's into loving someone else it's just loving some other doll or just you know taking care of some other doll as their favorite so imagine this situation again referring to toy story in which you know toy story one you had like woody was andy's favorite toy and then boss like year came along and you know they have like this quarrel in which Boss didn't knew it was a toy, but it was still Andy's favorite now. And, you know, Woody felt like it doesn't matter what I do. You know, this human is always to always choose this other doll because Boss is their favorite now. So you kind of have to play with that. You can't put yourself into every single character. 
You know, you have to put yourself into different characters that are acting different, that are thinking different. For some, it's just completely vain and they're completely into their appearance and how they look and how they, they just see the world through this pink lens, you know, Prince Charming and all. And um, then you have the ones who are completely on the ground, who are completely defeated or completely my life can get any worse I have nothing to lose I want to just disappear I want to disintegrate and then you have the ones who are pissed off and say like humans treat us like shit why should we be any better to them than they are to us you know and then you have the ones who say this is our place we should not be messing with humans because this is our place we are being dolls into this period of our existence and you know it's no matter what they do we need to give them a chance you know these are people and we were people once so we know being humans isn't easy and and you know there are Every single character is a different one. Every single character sees the world differently. And every human that it's mentioned towards the history sees the world differently. So then again, I found people that I, I just, I read their books. They were really lengthy, lengthy books. They weren't just small books. They were lengthy books. And uh, they have like 200 characters. And 200 of those characters, 190 were the writer and I was like dude I can recognize you anywhere I don't care which page it is this is you 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 with tit this is you with dick this is you with a wig this is you with you know like take yourself away from that because these are different characters that should have different motivations that should be different and act different and that I think is the number one challenge for people who starts to write how not to write yourself there are two basic very big issues with people writing one avoid Mary Sue's two avoid that every single character is you you know it's not a bio autobiography you know it's, it's, it's not an autobiography it's just a different book with a different person Think about what the priorities of that character will be. You know, I need to address that I had help with one of them, which is, you know, this this sphere that I have attached. Uh, you know, kind of already know he's completely different from me, you know, character-wise. Always has been, has been with me since I was a child. Just don't ask. I'm weird. I communicate with the dead. It's just not th- something that I look forward or that I use. It's something that fucking happens, you know. I spend a lot of time alone because, you know, and I- I'm not schizophrenic or anything, you know, like I've been through every single doctor because, you know, when growing up, it will be, have, be so much more <sighs> explicable to understand if, you know, I go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a medical doctor and says you have some medical issue. And even if we can't treat it, we know you have it. No, I was fucking healthy. I just speak with dead people. Oftenly, dead people will manifest in me. Oftenly, you know, I didn't even realize, but some other people around me who were absolutely not aware of my condition will see me with another face of somebody else that didn't knew, you know, aggressive many times. Um, this often happened when the people had like an ill intention towards me. So I guess that was, you know, my main one, which is the one attached to me. And and we kind of get along with it. You know, we, we kind of just like, we, we were like roomies on the same space. She, it's not on my body 24-7. I do not allow that. And um, it's like a voluntary possession. You know, like, you see all these movies about people contorting and stop eating and, you know, trying to fuck a priest for some shit, whole reason. Uh, but no, no, it's, it's not like that. If it is a voluntary possession, you kind of just shake hands and say, Hey, do you want to spend the rest of my life with me? 
And the guy is just like, sure, nothing else to do. So what are you going to bring to my, you know, existence? I can protect you from, you know, assholes. I can't just drive them away because I'm dead and I can tell which ones are assholes and you cannot. Cool. Um, what do you want in exchange? A little bit of your energy, just, you know, minor things, kind of minor recognition that I'm there. Just work for me. You know, just don't exercise me. That's that kind of shit. It just kind of works. And I'm like, I can work with that. I can work with that. You know, I've been, been through worse, been through worse. You know, not calling a priest. Yeah, you might have a problem with that whenever you kind of just go somewhere too sacred. I recognize you not to do that. Just don't go near people who also can see dead people because there's a chance they will see me and will try to, you know, expel me and I'll have to take control of your body and just make them shit their pants or some shit like that. Yeah, got it. Okay, fine. We're, we're, and then we just shake hands and just, you know, grew up. And perhaps I'm alive because of that shit there. Because I cannot believe the amount of coincidence that accumulated for me to be alive in 2023 I just I cannot you know my life is not the best but statistically speaking I should be dead from at early 2008 so kudos <laughs> so yeah uh, you can uh, you know you, you can't call bullshit on this because you can say like, oh, that, that lady has, you know, issues. But um, for people who knows about this, you kind of feel their personality. You kind of feel who they are after a couple of years, you know, being constantly on and off, you know, around you. You can know them. You, can, you even know them when you bring somebody they don't like or to do something they do not agree with. You might be asking why. And yeah, sure, you can call me crazy and you can call everything a coincidence, but they will blow off fuses, they will just uh, turn on and off uh, electronic devices, they will generate images on uh, camera recordings that are performed during that period of time that are not there. And when you watch to the tape, you kind of see something that in real life just thought, is it, it isn't there, it's not existing there. Um, they can make the other people see some things that are not there. And by that, I don't mean just, you know, a shadow on the corner of your eye. I mean, like fully length, another face on top of yours and not just a welcoming face, just like a very, I've been told, ugly, demonic face. You know, uh, the most well description I ever got from one of my now former for a lot boyfriend was um, you turn around your face and your face was wrong. I said like, what do you mean with wrong? You know, you just jump out of the seat and just crawl into the ground like I was the devil. He said, like, your face was wrong. It was not your face. It was red. Your entire face was red and wrong. And, and he couldn't just articulate, like, a better reply out of that. And, of course, that relationship didn't prosper after that. You know, like, we have been dating, like, a couple days. It didn't prosper after that. Um... Perhaps I didn't want it to prosper because, you know, if my friend who had been keeping me safe for so long just is showing that to that guy, it must mean something. It must be, you know. Apparently this shit that is stuck with me knows things that I do not or realize some type of character that some people is. And when I can handle it, it just doesn't show up. No, that's something that I notice. When I can handle the situation, it doesn't show up. It shows up when I'm not being aware of something that is going on or if I can't handle something. That being said, I'm not invincible. I'm not Superman. It's not like you're going to shoot me and bullets are going to ricochet. No, it's, it's not like that. You know, I'm a real human, normal person. You could kill me easily, but there is a very you know, possible percent in which 
the bullet is not going straight to my heart, but miss it for a millimeter. And I get saved because of that. So while these things happen, yes, sure, in real life, a lot of times, still weird that, you know, so many coincidences just keep on happening. Um, also fits on batteries. Now, I don't know what it is with electrical power and, you know, dead people, but they kind of feed on... If they don't find, you know... Um, I have a lot of things around my room that have, you know, um, batteries. Uh, like, you know, those Neko cards that, you know, you see in the Chinese market or other things that are moving. And as soon as they run out of battery, I need to get up and change it. Because the time I avoid doing that, my reptiles or my pets start dying. And I don't know if that is a coincidence, but I just recorded more than 10 times in which one thing happened right after the other. It's like they don't have more energy here and they go to suck somebody else's energy. And that wouldn't be that crazy to think about because if you think about neurons and the brain and how does it work, we work with electricity. And by we, I mean like humans and anything that it's alive, you know. Uh, reptiles, cats, whatever it is, you know, we work with synapses. And a synapses is a biological process in which one neuron transmits to another a message by electric impulses. That's why when you dissect a frog and you apply electricity, their muscles move because, you know, our entire body moves with electricity. I know, shockers. So <laughs> the thing is that, you know, I prefer to give them triple A batteries, then give them my leopard geckos or give them my cats, you know, like it, it, it is better. But apparently they kind of use that. I don't know for what. I, I really don't know for what, uh, but they kind of use, they, they use energy and they can mess up energy. Like whenever somebody has been in my room and they don't like it, um, you know, the rest of the electrical um, on the house is just fine, but it starts to answer questions with lights or the turning on and off the TV or then, you know, because I kind of do that. Because it could be something that is wrong with the electricity. So it's a like, okay, if it's really you and you don't want this person to be here, just stop blinking the fucking light from the room. Just blink the TV. And as soon as I say that, the TV is blinking. I sound like, okay, but I'm still not convinced about this blink just turn on my my computer and then my computer turns on on itself i'm not even touching it nobody is so yeah and then you kind of make a couple questions sometimes they just don't answer or he just don't answer i i, I kind of feel it's a he i don't know why i always felt it's a he not a she or not an it it's a he you know but it, it kind of is there, you know, like it's, it's just, it's easier to write that character down because it's there, you know, it's just not something I'm making up. You know, I know I'm not making it up. You might think I am, but, you know, I'm not making it up. Um, I wish I was. I, I don't speak to the dead every single day. I just don't, don't do that. You know, like it just happens. Some of them just cross my path and some of them are not even interested in me. That's why people say, see, are you afraid of dying? And I say, like, I'm not suicidal, but I'm not afraid of being dead. Because I know, I, even if I don't have the answers to the afterlife, I know well enough that, you know, the end of existence is not just our physical bodies. Our physical bodies are kind of a vessel in which, I'm going to tie this back to my book, a physical vessel It's what Japanese people think dolls are. Japanese people think, you know, there is the spirit of a person, which is the equivalent of a soul, but I don't use the word soul because soul comes from Christianity. And I don't want to tie this to a religion. I want this to be as neutral as possible. So every person has a spirit, which is a soul, and that soul is who they are. And, you know, your body is just something that will wither and die. And at some point you will have a new one or you will be able to occupy an object, 
like I don't know a, a doll or a toy or something that was important to you or you feel identified with or you could just ramble around without a physical form but you know you're still you and that's what matters so all in all you know I said it was going to be a short video I lied I did just I fucking lied um but hey give me a shout out if you want me to you know do that a podcast about the chapters of my book like a story if you would be interested because if nobody's going to watch it like I'm going to go like fuck you know like why did I did this like three three replays and one of them was mine just to make sure it uploaded right so you know like uh but if you're into that you know I'm crazy I'm peculiar and I don't give a shit about being politically correct and I don't give a shit about money so Um, as long as I have a roof over my head, a plate of simple food on front of me, and a bare minimum of needs covered, I'm just survivor. Now I'm a survivor. I just I don't need more than that because I realize that our current situation it might hurt, but it's not permanent. It's going to end at some point. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be never, but it's going to end. So, yeah, just let me know. And if you have any other questions, just leave it on the comments. And that will be it.